it's Wes. And today, it's been a long time coming, I know I'm a little late to the game on this one, it's time to review the Sony A7 Mark III. Hit it! This camera's been out for a little while, but I've been waffling for a while on whether or not to get the A7 Mark III or the A7 R3. This is just a review, not a first look, not a long-term review, just a review. I've shot this camera at nine or ten weddings now, and while many might call that long-term, I don't consider it yet. I haven't given this thing quite enough bumps just yet to really consider to have put it through all its paces and declare whether or not it is long-term viable. But I have used this a significant amount, so I finally feel like I've had enough experience to gather some firm conclusions though. I don't want to get too deep into the reads for the specs and stuff. I'm just going to go over the things that I think are most significant in differentiating this camera from other cameras. First of all, you have the same 693 point phase detect spread on the sensor as the A9, and now the same 425 contrast detect points since the A9 was updated to match the contrast system in the A7 III. Not the same autofocus system though, just the same points. You got a stabilized sensor, an OLED viewfinder. Not the same OLED viewfinder that's in the A9 and the A7R Mark III. You got dual card slots, 4K video recording, flip screen. This is unmistakably the third generation 7 series Sony Alpha camera. It shares a lot of the same body design, a lot of the same features as the A9 and A7R Mark III. And it has some features that the A9 doesn't have. On the side here, we flip open the tabs, we'll see that we have a USB-C port. Why am I pointing that out? This allows much faster tethering. It's not just a fancy cord or a reversible plug, but this will allow you to shoot RAW tethered to say Capture One, and it will transfer the RAW images in about a second to your computer. That is fantastic. I'm not just talking JPEG here. If you plug an A9 in to your computer or an A7 II, using the USB-B port at USB 2 speeds, it takes 7 to 10 seconds for each RAW file to hit your computer. That's phenomenal. So when you're doing, say, a headshot or a corporate session and you're tethering to the computer, those images are popping up super fast. It's impressive and it really helps with your workflow. Love that USB-C port. It's not just a pretty face. Versus the A7 II, we now have a bigger Z series battery. And this battery will actually last about 25% longer than in the A7R3 or the A9. Why is that? That's because of this viewfinder. It has a lower resolution, less pixels to push. I didn't think that I was going to see a big difference because my right eye doesn't focus that well, but I can see the difference. The viewfinder in this is 1024 by 768 whereas in the A9 and the A7R3, you got 1280 by 960 Not a huge difference but I can kind of see a little bit of the screen door effect. And one of the bigger differences for me is that I find the brightness control, the auto brightness control in this has a lot less steps. You can see it jumping up and down in brightness and doesn't tend to be super accurate with the brightness that it portrays. So I can never really trust my exposure in the viewfinder. I gotta go back to the histogram in the viewfinder to really be sure of what you're seeing. I never found that with the A9 and when I tried out the A7R3. They seem to be much more accurate on exposure in the viewfinder. Rather strange, but that's what I've found. One big difference between this and the A9 is that this lacks the stacked sensor. So what does that mean? When you're shooting in silent mode, which is a fantastic feature of the A7 III, there is some blackout, and you have a much higher risk of banding or image artifacting if you are shooting under artificial lighting. So if you're under LEDs or fluorescent bulbs, you have to be very careful if you're shooting silently with this. With the A9, I still recommend that you double check and make sure that things aren't getting weird, but you can be pretty confident that it's not going to be causing banding unless you can visibly see the lights flickering with your eyes. But the mechanical shutter in this is twice as fast as the one in the A9. Very quick, especially if you have the electronic first curtain shutter turned on. If you turn it off, it's about the same speed as the A9's mechanical shutter with the electronic first curtain shutter turned on. So again, the shutter moves twice as fast, and your blackout when taking pictures with the A7 III is easily half of the one in the A9 with the mechanical shutter. 
Now we're not talking about the like, fully electronic shutter in the A9, where there is no blackout at all, and it is phenomenal. But if you're working with flash, the A7 III is a fantastic camera to use because the mechanical shutter is so much more responsive than the one in the A9. And if you're working in studio with flash, going back to this USB-C port, this is, I'm sorry to say, A9, a far superior camera to use in the studio to a point, which we'll get to in the autofocus section, coming soon. You know the spec list. This has a ton of features. It doesn't have every feature that every camera's ever had, but it's high up there. It's a nine out of 10 for feature set. Build quality. This is another point where people get a little bit confused. Magnesium is listed as what this camera is made out of, but that's only partially what this camera is made out of. The front plate you see here that the lens attaches to, that is magnesium, that is correct. But the back plate around the sides and such, this is actually just plastic. This camera was aggressively marketed when it first came out, aggressively priced to really shake up the whole industry. And that is one of the points where they cut costs. Not all of this is magnesium. It is a little bit lighter in the hand, which is funny because the weight difference is only slight. The A9 is 673 grams and the A7 III is 650 grams. That's only 23 grams difference. But the reason why it feels so light in the hand is most of the weight with this camera, because a lot of the body is plastic, is concentrated in the battery and the grip. So, once you have shifted the center of gravity over, even though it's only a tiny bit lighter, it feels significantly lighter in your hand, which is actually kind of nice. So better battery life and a lighter camera. And one more place that they've cut costs with the A7 III is on this back display screen, which ostensibly seems like a lot of display screens. However, they used a cheaper linear polarizer on the screen rather than a circular polarizer. What does that mean to you? Well, it might not mean anything at all to you. Maybe just to me. I prefer to wear polarized sunglasses as they block out better, more light. And so, with my A9 here, if you put on polarized sunglasses, it doesn't matter which way you're pointing it, you can still see the screen. However, on the A7 III, if you are in a normal position, straight landscape orientation, polarized sunglasses completely block out this screen. On nicer LCD screens, such as even on an iPhone, doesn't matter which way you have your glasses, it kind of varies the intensity a little bit, but you can still see the screen. Haven't had this issue since back in the day of the A6000, when in a vertical orientation, you could no longer see the screen. That's much preferable to the horizontal orientation, which is kind of the default orientation of using a camera screen, which you're out of luck if you want to do that. Again, might not affect you at all. Kind of get to my goat. The rest of the build quality, again, is very similar to the other two cameras. You have the same flaps, more or less the same seals. Some debate over whether the A9 is sealed better or not, and those are just kind of wiggle words in the fine print of the descriptions on the Sony website. I don't really know if there's really any difference between them, practically. I haven't had any issues in weather. I've used it in the snow and in the rain. Nothing super heavy yet, like I have with the A9, but it's held out just fine. And the paint, just like on the A9, is slowly wearing away. You have a lot of sharp corners on this camera that a lot of Canon and Nikon cameras just don't have. They're very rounded. I'm fine with that because I much prefer the design of these cameras. And I know I'm in the minority with that, but I find Canon and Nikon cameras just look like uninspired wads of melted plastic. Sorry. And the shutter itself is rated for a very high 500,000 count. So it should be durable. Overall, it feels fairly rugged. I wouldn't want to throw this across the parking lot or anything. And obviously it's not up to like a Pentax or a 1D or 5D, D5 level of ruggedness. So I'm giving this a seven out of 10 for build quality. Handling, again, very similar to the other Sony cameras. You have some tiny buttons. For some reason, the buttons on the A7 III are just a tiny bit mushier than the ones on the A9. 
I would think that maybe it's just my copy of it. But this is the fourth one that I've used and they've all felt more or less the same. So I'm going to say that these buttons are just a little bit mushier. The grip itself feels a lot warmer in the hand because there is more plastic in here than there is metal. On a cold day, this is actually much more comfortable to hold than the A9 or the A7R3 because there's less metal. That's a bit of a weird trade-off to talk about, but it actually does make things more comfortable. But hey, on a cold day, why don't you just wear gloves? We've got that problem with the grip being very close to the mount. In uh, warmer climes, you probably don't have to worry too much about that, but as soon as I put on even the slightest of leather gloves, things get real tight in here. Most of the time it doesn't bother me. I have more or less average sized hands, so it's no big deal and I can still get in there, but I can see how that would be a problem for a lot of people with big hands. This camera is not made for sausage fingers. And then if you do want a bigger camera, more grip, you can get the optional battery grip that is the same one for the A9 and the A7R3. Pretty convenient, aside from the fact that it's pretty expensive. But there are some less expensive options from companies like Mikey that you can put on there and most people find that they work just fine. You can also get the overpriced pinky grip made by Sony. It's just a piece of carved aluminum. The problem with that is it covers up the battery door. So it's a bit of a design fail on their part. I would have liked a more considered design. I myself usually have the spider holster attached to the bottom for mirrorless cameras. And I find that very convenient. This is very light. Overall handling, it's not perfect. It's only moderately worse than the A9 just because of the slightly mushy buttons. But again, it's an A7 series camera. You already know what to expect. It's a seven out of 10. Image quality. This is where this one really steps it up. You have one of the cheapest new full frame cameras that you can get, 24 megapixels for $2,000. And the image quality is stellar. It has class leading dynamic range, class leading high ISO performance. That was surprising. It's a brand new backside illuminated 24 megapixel sensor. What does that mean? It means it gathers all the light that it can get. It also has a weaker anti-aliasing filter than the one in the A9. If you take pictures with the two of them side by side, same lens, you'll actually have slightly sharper results with the A7 Mark III. I know this experientially because I have both cameras and have shot them side by side. When I first noticed this, I thought, that's weird, there must be something wrong here. And then I, after a lot of Googling, I finally found out that other people have noticed this. This is sharper, your pictures will be sharper. Because of that, you are a little bit more prone to anti-aliasing than you are with the A9, so that's always a trade-off. Because many would say that resolution is a part of image quality, they value the 42, the 50 megapixels. I do have to take one point off this for not being absolutely perfect. You just don't have a lot of pixels, and because of that, you can get anti-aliasing. At 42 or 50 megapixels, it is harder to get an anti-aliasing problem. So this gets a nine out of 10 for image quality. Stellar, just not the most pixels. But who cares? I don't even want that many pixels. Autofocus. This is another highly controversial subject. When this camera was launched, there were some, shall we say, unclear statements made about the relationship between the autofocusing system in this camera and the one in the A9. As I said at the beginning, in explanation, this has the same spread of autofocus points as in the A9. So is that the same system? Not really. The A9 reads its autofocusing system about 60 times a second. The A7 III about 20 times a second. Both seem really fast, but one is faster. And the autofocusing processor in the A9 is faster. It's the same one that's in the A6400, the brand new APS-C camera. So good for the A6400. That means that the focusing system in the A9 is just a little bit more capable. Just a little bit. But sometimes it's the little bit that makes it all the difference in the world. Unlike the older A7 series models like the A7R2, A7 II, this isn't nearly as easily fooled by backlit situations and low light. In very low light situations, this camera is extremely confident. Not quite as confident as the A9. Again, almost, but not quite. Having taken maybe 100,000 pictures with the A9 at this point, I have a very strong intuition about what pictures are going to be in or out of focus after I've taken a set of pictures. So when I go through editing, I am usually not even remotely surprised at what I see 
in my sets of images. So now when I'm editing pictures, and half of them are with the a7 III, and just judging from which pictures are slightly out of focus in a certain set, or rather the percentage thereof, I can immediately guess which pictures were taken with the a7 III. Generally, just one more picture out of, say, 20 is out of focus with this. Or I'll get extras that are just not quite there. Again, this is a phenomenal focusing system. It's just about 5 to 10 percent weaker than the one in the A9. So it's not quite the same. Video autofocus, again, is phenomenal. It is confident, it is fast, doesn't hunt around, very smooth. The focus transitions aren't quite as smooth and as natural as the ones that you would get from, say, a modern Canon camera with dual pixel autofocus, but it is easily just as reliable. It doesn't really get much better than this and the A9, which I am currently filming on. That's why I'm not holding them side by side. The last difference with the autofocus is that this will use phase detect focus down to f11, whereas the A9 with the latest firmware can go to f16. But how does that affect you? Some studio photographers like to shoot with everything in focus. This is more of a fashion photography thing. So they'll shoot at f9 to f11. But you say, my camera works just fine to f11 in continuous phase detect focus, so that should be fine. That number, f11 or f16 of the limit, it's not just a sudden cutoff. That's when it stops working altogether. The closer you get to that, the more you start to lose the outer focusing points, and the weaker the continuous focusing overall becomes. So if your light level is lower and you're shooting a little bit out of the frame, you're going to be fighting with this camera even as high as about f8. In good light, shooting toward the middle, yeah, you are fine up to f11. But with the A9, if you're shooting at f11, you still have that breathing room and it's still pretty confident at that level. If you like to shoot things at very high f-stops, but still in continuous focus mode, you're shooting living, breathing subjects beyond f8, this can be a little bit hard to wrangle if you don't have a lot of light. If you had a lot of light up to f11, you're more or less fine. But if you want to go beyond that, especially, say, shooting with a teleconverter and a long lens, you can be multiplying that aperture down to f11 very easily. So say you wanted to go birding and you're teleconverting your lens all the way down to f11, that's your maximum aperture, you're going to be shooting more or less toward the center of the frame with this, even though the focusing points in an ideal scenario go out to the edge because toward the edge, they'll be less reliable at that point. Just something to keep in mind. Most of you, this isn't even going to concern you, but it's something that people don't talk about and can catch you off guard because you don't see it coming if you don't know all the ins and the outs of this camera. So bringing it right back, the autofocus system in this is still stellar, super reliable. It's nine out of 10. Not perfect, but pretty great. Value. As always, this is where things get a bit complicated. Especially now, the price of the A9 came down, the price of the A7R3 came down. Nikon and Canon launched their mirrorless cameras. Canon then came out with the EOS RP, super cheap mirrorless camera. All right, let's get to some numbers. I'm just going to be listing cameras that I have personally seen people cross shopping with this camera. If you don't agree that it should be in this lens, it's just because I've heard people cross shopping specifically those ones. Over here, wherever that is. So the 5D Mark IV, $29.99, solid, full frame, DSLR. Canon 6D Mark II, $12.99, much cheaper, lacking in image quality, not very modern camera, but also has some cut corners just like this camera does. The EOS R, very comparable, confident camera, not quite up there in stills autofocus, missing a card slot, $22.99. Sony A9 down to $3,500, great value now. A7R3, $2,800 now. A7 II, the predecessor of this camera, is only $900 now. That's what we're filming our B-roll on because it's still a decent sensor. Doesn't have the same low light, very finicky autofocus compared to a modern camera. So it kind of belongs at that price point in this day and age, honestly. Again, you got the RP at $1,299. The Nikon Z6 down to 2000 bucks now, and the D750, tried and true stallion of wedding photography that will explode when you least expect it. Just make sure you bring it back up. Other than that, it's a great camera. Only 1300 bucks now. 
So this is in the middle of a bit of a mess, but when you take into account how confident, how full of features this thing is, you've got S-Log, something that even the A9 doesn't have, phenomenal mechanical shutter. This is still a solid deal after all this time that this camera has come out and the price hasn't changed, but all the competition is piled into the scene. Still worth every penny. It's a nine out of 10 for value. Not a no-brainer, but an easy consideration and still top of the pack. So, what's that give us? After some quick math, that's a 50 out of 60. Pretty solid score, but I mean, the numbers are largely made up and subjective anyway, so take what you will. I hope that the information that I've provided you has been useful. If you want to buy this camera or one of the cameras that I've talked about today, there's links in the description. You can help support the channel. If you have the a7 III and have some thoughts about it, feel free to leave a comment. Any questions? Leave a comment. I hang out down there all the time and love answering questions. About anything. Anything. Okay, let's not get weird. Too late. Am I keeping this camera? Absolutely. Am I 100% happy with this camera? No. I mean, not 100% happy with anything. The mechanical shutter in the A9, it annoys me. It's too slow. The silent shutter in this is always slightly disappointing, but no camera is perfect. In the end, why did I get this overall instead of the A7R3? Only one reason. Megapixel count. The A7R3 has too many. I shoot three to 4,000 pictures between both my cameras on a wedding day. And that would just slow my workflow down too much. I don't need 42 megapixels. All I need is 24, so that's fine. If the A7R3 had a very reliable, like without a, any anti-aliasing artifacts, 24 megapixel mode, I definitely would have gotten that instead of this camera for the better viewfinder and for the versatility. But you win some, you lose some. Overall, yeah, I'm perfectly fine with this camera. Very happy, great value. As a matter of fact, I think I might go take some photos. Oh hey, it's Wes. Give it the guns, why do they give it the guns?